Hi, everybody. Welcome here to Speak Up Monday here, Tropical Nomad, every Monday at 6.30. And obviously, you can hit, see these very handsome men. To my left, we have Brother JP, Brother Pablo, and Brother Matthew, um, Bali Collective. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about Mural Fest today. And for those of you who don't realize, uh, Mural Fest, and my brother JP of, over here, the founder and creator of the fourth and fifth largest public mural art festivals in the world that started off in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's here. He calls Bali home. And, and since coming here, I think we kind of met up, you know, a couple of years ago where you had this crazy vision. And I thought, that sounds pretty cool. And then we worked on this event together. And then I realized you could actually pull it off. And then I met Brother Pablo. Well, Matt, I actually met prior, prior to Pablo, and I met Pablo, and then I, I realized the, the, the whole vision and what drives it. And I'm so happy to be part of it and uh, so happy to be able to show people tonight where your heart and soul is at behind the project. So let's just speak up Monday. I'm Robert Ian Bonick, the, the tourism architect. And today, remember, it's very important that you log this date in your diary. So July 9th. So July 9th will be the launch of Mural Fest at Tomorrow Gallery. And you can go to muralfest.com for more information. That's muralfest.com for more information. So let's get started. So the first question, you know, that definitely comes in, you know, what, and we're going to see and speak to all of you so we feel all of your energy and vibe, right? So we'll start with you, JP. So Mural Fest, let's start there. Um, what is it? Because I know that, you know, the paint on the wall isn't really what, it's, it's a little bit, it's a tiny component. But tell us, what is Mural Fest to you? Uh, first, uh, thank you all for uh, coming and Robert for hosting. Yeah, almost 300 episodes, y'all. Crushing it. Crushing it. Ooh. Oh, the corona. What's, what's going on? This man don't sleep. We don't stop. <laughs> All right, so uh, Mural Fest is one expression of Bali Collective, eh, where we use arts as a catalyst to create impact NFTs to support our high-impact NGOs and to support our creative communities. So what does that mean? We, uh, we bring artists, we pair them with NGOs, or yayasans as they're called here, and then we create impact NFTs. So they physically create the murals, but also fine art, fashion, film, music, all creative arts. And then we mint them and create collections of these NFTs, and then 40% of the sales of the NFTs goes to the yayasan, 20% to the artists, 20% to the investors, and then 20% to the festival. Uh, these are sustainable NFTs. Uh, so we're trying to create a movement across the world where anyone who's creating collections of NFTs thinks about the world first within them. You know, so they can, they can have all their ego projects and all the fun stuff that they're doing, but also think about the planet and the world and the animals and everybody lives under the sun, you know? We, we, we have a, a beautiful opportunity to, to bring a lot of people together. And, you know, you can do a lot by poking a finger, but you bring all the fingers together and you just punch through the wall. So mm. uh, we're really excited to, to bring the festival to Bali. Uh, and we've had so much uh, feedback from people all over the world that are catching on, that they, they're, everyone's asking for Bali uh, 2023 in their country. So uh, let's, uh, let's create a beautiful case study here to, to where we can multiply this and uh, bring a lot of joy and, and healing to the world. So. You know, so we get that, that, that Mural Fest, right? We get what it is. It's an expression of Bali Collective. Um, we get that it's, you know, it has this beautiful pairing of artists of all shapes, sizes, descriptions, you know, and combining technology in such a way um, to impact in a powerful, positive way those organizations, yayasans, NGOs, which are doing good work, right? Okay, so... The question is then, you know, like, why you? So what in your background, JP, what in your history, you know, like, why did you do this in the first place? What is driving you? What's behind it? What's underneath? Who is JP? <laughs> uh, well, I'd say uh, in my youth, I felt I didn't have a choice. It, it was an inherited uh, 
a lineage of, uh, that I'd say I, my grandmother really uh, gave to me, but even before her. So uh, a long line of creatives who were social impact warriors. Uh, so like everybody from developing schools to healthcare systems to homelessness to you name it, like my family, uh, we've, my uncle came up with a name for us, uh, Kian Gozis. Uh, and Kian Gozis Swahili for leader, teacher, healer. Uh, leader, teacher, healer. Yeah, so for 25 years, he worked for the National Crime Prevention Council in the United States where he was in charge of getting youth out of gangs. Uh, and he became a Yoruba priest and he had a bangle for every kid that he got out of a gang and until his arms were completely filled and like he couldn't even wear them anymore. Like this, this brother had no fear. And uh, it wasn't until the last time he was seriously injured, like going into gang territory and be like, brother, you got two kids? This ain't gonna happen. Like you gotta stay, take a step back. And then now he's still like working heavily, like being a, a social, uh, a social worker and, uh, and, and leader and, and therapist, -y, but like everyone in my family, you know, like my, my father's been developing healthcare systems for over 50 years, you know, been on the forefront of uni universal healthcare to my sister's head of uh, homeless family divisions in Los Angeles who has over 50,000 homeless people. Uh, my other sister is uh, an administrator for the American Cancer Society. And like uh, before Corona, she was in Africa several times a year, like the international department. But she's also an amazing artist that we'll bring into uh, the festival as well. So we're also inviting artists from all over the world that can't be present to also submit their art and then we'll attach them to Yaya Sons here and then back home to their favorite organizations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, yeah, like uh, my, my grandmother was uh, Oprah before Oprah, you know? Uh, and my great grandfather pretty much adopted Mahalia Jackson. Like he, he had a, he was a parishioner of a Baptist church in New Orleans and he, they had the greatest gospel choir, you know? Uh, and Mahalia's family, her father was a parishioner of a Baptist church just down the road and she came to sing with the family and was basically there all the time. So she became older sister to my grandmother and then my grandmother became her pianist and background singer. Like for people who don't know who Mahalia Jackson was, she was the first black person to play Carnegie Hall. She was best friends with Martin Luther King. If you go to YouTube and you type in a, the I Have a Dream speech on the Lincoln Memorial, you can hear her talking to Malcolm in the middle of his speech being like, Malcolm, tell him about the, the mountaintop. You know, like, and then he goes off script and he starts ad-libbing, like, to that part of the speech. That, that is Mahalia. So, like, that is the, the family that I was raised in of these social impact warriors that we use art and music and technology as catalysts in the development of youth leaders and stronger communities. And I've just woven that into my entire life, you know? So mm -hmm. it's a blessing to be here and to share it with y'all. Man, love that, love that. And we got Pablo uh, next to you, so one, one Pablo. I think it's great because, you know, what we're starting here is this opportunity for people to get to know what drives Mural Fest, what drives Bali Collective, right? So I think it's really important that people get to feel who you are, right? And when people feel who you are, then it makes perfect sense what you're doing next, right? Because the two go together. You know, and if you if you're not doing kind of what you were born to do, like you feel there's a there's a mismatch. You know, that it doesn't it's not authentic. It doesn't align. It's not congruent. Yeah. So that's why we spend we speak up Monday a bit of time to go into people's backstories to understand what drives them, where they're from, and then it becomes very clear as to why they're doing what they're doing, and and you get it, and you want to be part of it, right? So, brother Pablo, uh, for you from Mexico, you know, so so what? How did you get to this? Like, what was the journey? I mean, w we understand JP, uh, that it comes from his family and his lineage. And, and by the way, um, in my family tree is Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. They're all Jamaican Maroons, right? So my great, great, anyway, but that's a whole other story for another day. Uh, but for you, brother, brother Pablo, like, uh, yeah, how did you find your way uh, into this? And what, what activates your passion? Yeah, so over to you, brother. Cool, right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I wish I had JP's skills for talking. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a man of very, very few words. 
So yeah, um, cool. What brings me here? So my background, uh, well, I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I studied business engineering uh, because I always find pleasure in kind of solving problems. And that just led me into starting a career in finance. From finance, I started looking at my boss's life and his boss's life and his boss's boss's life. And I just realized that that was not really for me. So yeah, I quit my job and I just started traveling. Uh, I went through so many different types of jobs from construction, waiting, hospitality. <clears throat> So many different jobs, and I realized <laughs> uh, that all of those jobs are kind of cool in a way. Like, there's no such thing as a small job or a job that it's too big. Uh, it all depends on the experience that it gives you, and um, what it's actually moving you to perform that job. And yeah, here I am. So last six years, five and a half years in Bali, I've been focusing mostly in tourism, hospitality, but with COVID, that was pretty much gone. And I started questioning myself, okay, is this a place where I wanna live? Uh, or do I wanna go live somewhere else? And why would I like to live here? Uh, because of these things and these things, but why, what do I not like about this place? And I realized that there were a lot of things that I really didn't like. So should I move because of the things that I don't like? Or should I stay because of the things that I like? Or should I just try to find a way to fix the things that I don't like so I can have a good place for myself to live? And cool. And so I start working with, well, not really working, but I start supporting NGOs and I managed to support um, one. It's very popular. It's called Plastic Exchange. Um, I saw that it was running around Ubud and then I live in the Luwatu area and I saw that it, there was nothing happening down there. And I said, okay, someone should start this here. Someone, someone, <laughs> waiting, someone. All right, cool. So I'll call the plastic exchange guy. So I called Janur and said, hey, are you guys in Luwatu? Would you guys like to come over here and just start doing the same here? And all I did was just to connect him with a whole bunch of different banjars and local leaders around, and that just kind of grabbed motion and started running by itself. From there, I said, OK, this experience was pretty cool, something that I never really saw myself doing. It's kind of. Uh, rolling like a snowball and the effort that I had to do for it was pretty much nothing. I just had to tell one guy to come meet with other guys and they just took it from there. So sometimes you just need to get someone to deliver the message of how you can help. What we're doing through Mural Fest is just trying to make the dynamics like very accessible for everyone and very fun. We want to make sure that everyone knows that making a difference shouldn't be boring and it shouldn't be complicated. And yeah, that would be pretty much all in a nutshell. <laughs> thank you, thank you, brother man. You know, here's the thing. Yeah, like, there are, what I love about this right is that there's four people here with different personalities, right? Different ways of speaking, being, acting, behaving with different backgrounds, and audience here or audience watching are the same, right? All different. So it's interesting because there's always someone that you're speaking to that you may not even know is listening, but you are. So, and that's inspiring, brother. And one of the things, another one thing which I love about you is that, as I, when I, it's funny, when I describe you, I say you're economical with words, right? E economical with words, right? It's a nice way, right? Everyone's like, economical with words. And, but what you say always has power and it's always on point, right? And uh, when we spoke the, the other day, and by the way, no one knows what I'm about to ask him or, <laughs> so nothing's been set up here. You know, like we had an interaction um, after it, after the ICP event uh, with, uh, with with our brother Emilio, and, and it was interesting because what I got from you then was another dimension of you, which was this dimension of because everyone who's watching now gets that you're a warrior actually, right? True or not? True, true or true? You can see it. Like you can feel this guy's a warrior, and uh, when he when he lays his feet and he puts them down, he ain't moving. 
<laughs> that's what I get when I look at him. And, 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 like, and each time I see you and feel you, that's the same impression which I get. So if I'm correct, which I believe I am on this, you know, where does that stoic or that inner fortitude of yours, if I asked you, where does it come from, what would you say? Uh, never really questioned myself that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I like to just go for the things that I believe for. And, uh, and I always find a way that there's always a way to do it. You just need to... You don't even know exactly what you want to do, but you need to have an idea of what you want to do. And just stick to that idea, and somehow you just find uh, the path to it. It might take you through different circles and stuff, but just hold on to it, to what you believe in. Somehow, things just start moving. <laughs> Thank you, man. And, and before we move on to Matt, uh, just for people watching at home, like maybe ask yourself the same question, right? So if I were to ask you the same question, what would you say? So the question was along the lines of like, you know, what actually drives you really? Like when you pull all the shit away, like what actually really drives you? And getting complete with that is another level. Like, that's all I can say. And if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, you will <laughs> at some point. Because, like, when you're up here, like in life, there's, like, it's like there's three things which are quite important. One is, the, like, this clock. So, like, 12 to 1 is, like, these are the things that I know that I know. I know, I know my name. I know where I'm from. I know my face. I know how to... I know this guy, JP. Right? And this guy, Pablo. And this guy, Matt. That's great. Number two is like one till three, which is like, these are the things that I know that I don't know, right? And that could be that a rocket goes to space. I don't know how a jet engine works. I know it creates propulsion, but don't ask me to write down the chemical equation. I have no idea what that is to create thrust. I know that I don't know. And then this three till 12 is this whole area of subconscious, which is, this is what I don't know that I don't know. And these sorts of questions, and my brother Pablo, like, and I respect you, man, we said, well, I haven't thought about that before. It's a great question. And, and whatever or whenever anyone asks us something that we don't know the answer to, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. And just being honest with that and being complete with that opens up the, this other doorway into the stuff that I don't know that I don't know. And then the answers come days, moments later, where you start to, because again, where attention goes, energy flows and results follow. So if there's no attention going there, then there's no results there. So this is part of um, the beauty of this sort of conversation that we have every week. Um, it's about that, right? It's about finding out what drives us, what motivates us, what inspires us, the problems that we've had, the solutions that we've found, even if we're still trying to find those solutions. Like, this is, to me, what the essence is, right? And this is what allows you to see into people and then see yourself in other people. Because we're one person expressed seven billion times. Let, let that one soak in. All right, so brother, brother Matt Cook, <laughs> right, you're up. So, so if I asked you, um, like, how did you, because again, you're another person who I see, like, the word stoic, <laughs> it's just, it comes back to me with you too. Your energy is very solid, very still, very calm, very sure. You know, and the other day, again, ICP, um, you know, but when you were asked, questions were asked of you, you responded in such a way that, that basically gives us the same things. Very down to earth, very relatable, like kind, um, but very sure. You know, so that kind self-assuredness, were you always like that? Or, <laughs> or, or, or if not, like where did you find that? Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Rob. You, you have a gift of bringing out sides of people that uh, they don't know they have. So you just took me. I, I was thinking about how I'm going to explain my story and <laughs> what I'm going to say. And then Rob says that, you know. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. It, it actually took me back to um, so my father. He was a, was a great man. And he had a, he had a company that was focused on personal development. And uh, I had the pleasure of doing a, a series of trainings that his company developed um, at a young age or when I was 18. 
And one of the, the things that came up, and, and it, it's very interesting for, you, for me to get your perspective or your perception of me, uh, because in that, there's a series of trainings called the basic training, then the advanced course, and it's just all just you know hardcore going into yourself and your belief systems and limiting beliefs and breaking down barriers and how you uh, you know how others see you and how you see yourself, right? And I remember being in the basic training, and there was an exercise happening, and it was about you know interacting with all of your classmates, and it was okay, how do you think that they perceive you? Right, and you you, know, you feel like they maybe don't like you, or they, uh, you know, you have certain beliefs about yourself. And when you finally get the feedback from the whole room, right, then you take a moment and and they all tell you how they felt about you. You do an exercise, and you walk around, and you kind of look at each other in the eyes, and you know you kind of take a moment to really connect. And um, and people said things about me that I never realized I had. Maybe they thought I was approachable or kind or something. And I was like, really? You know? So I appreciate that perspective. And no, I wasn't always like that. Um, I, um, I grew up in California. I was born in California, Southern California, Newport Beach. And when I was about three years old, we moved up to the Bay Area, Marin County. Um, mother and father um, brought us up there. Sister was born. Uh, in Japan in 91. We actually moved from Northern California to Japan for one year uh, in 1991. And that was uh, f my first time living out of the US. Um, so that was a, quite an experience when I was 10 years old. Got to have my baby little sister born in, in Japan. And that was the beginning of being a brother. Um, but then we moved back to California and I finished eighth grade. And then dad surprised us with, hey, we're moving to Hong Kong. Just after eighth grade, and you know, we had the summer to prepare, and um, it was uh, it was definitely something I was very excited about at the time because uh, I had lived in Japan and I'd experienced that dynamic Asian city. Japan, Tokyo was at 10 years old. It was awesome, right? So I had a taste, and I was at Hong Kong. I had gone to Hong Kong once, and uh, and then Dad said we're moving there, and I said, Wow, cool, let's do it. But then, of course, it came time to move, and I had a girlfriend in eighth grade that I was in love with, and it was a disaster, yeah. So anyway, make a long story short, we moved to Hong Kong. I did high school in Hong Kong uh, for the first couple years, and I was a young little punk in Hong Kong, you know? I was um, fish out of water with a bunch of other expats, and we were just enjoying being free in Hong Kong and uh, international school. It was great. It was, uh, it was some of the best memories and times of my life. My network there is uh, something that I, I cherish. Um, and then I moved to the US for, for a university. So university in Boston, my parents stayed in Hong Kong. And I was coming back and forth from the US to Hong Kong uh, for, for holidays. And I remember feeling that I was, I was almost, you know, there was, it was the point of no return. I'd go to, to the US and, and all of my friends in the US would call me Hong Kong now. My name was Hong Kong. So at a young age, I felt like I was different because I had been living overseas. And then when I came back to Hong Kong, I felt at home. So I felt like the Asian culture, uh, so there was something about it that I, I really resonated with. Um, but at, the, you know, at a young age, you're still trying to find yourself and you don't really know who you are. I didn't know who I was. But um, so from, from Hong Kong, I, um, yeah, I went, I went to, to university and I moved, ended up moving back to Hong Kong and went into China. Okay, I started working in China um, after, after running a business from basically Bali was my first business. In, in university, we had to start a business uh, and it was, it, we chose Bali to start a business with my partner. So when I was about, uh, what was it, uh, I'd say 21, we opened up a small little factory here in, in Bali and then that went to Joke Jakarta. We were making handicrafts. Yeah. You know, the, the, the thing about your story, um, that this screams out to me. So you're a kid who gets moved around a lot, which you embrace. But for those people here, you know, how do you find your center yeah. when you're moving around so much? Yeah. And was there an experience yeah. that gave you like that, yeah. that, that insight into finding it? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I was chasing my tail, looking for my purpose and trying to make money. And finally in China, you know, we had a business and uh, we still have that business. But what happened, long story short, is my father got sick. Okay, so my parents moved from Hong Kong to Bali and dad was having this little speech impediment that we didn't know what was happening. And I was visiting twice a year 
And every time I would come here, I'd say, Mom, do you see something in Dad? And she would say, yes, actually I do. And then, and then we kind of started to talk about it as a family. He got diagnosed with Parkinson's. And I was in Hong Kong and China with my, my girlfriend at the time and, and our business partners. And it got to a point where I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision that was very confronting. It was, do I keep doing what I'm doing now? It was a fork in, in my life. It was like, do I keep doing this right now and let that happen over there? Or do I change everything about what I'm doing? And do I move to Bali with my girlfriend, who's my wife now, and do I focus on what's most important, which was family, okay? And that was my father. So we fit in so much in four years when I moved back. We walked the Camino Santiago. We, we did as much as we possibly could to save his life. We didn't end up saving his life, but I think that through him and his, his sickness, there was a, an awakening within me uh, where life became so much more clear. And he was seven years old when he passed away. He had worked all his life to make money so he could retire and play golf. I play golf because of him. I used to take him out on the golf course as he was dying, and I'd be his seatbelt when I'm going around and showing him that I'm playing golf and he would be coaching me, but he could barely talk, barely swallow. He was wilting away, and he just liked to eat French fries. You know, I'd take him to the clubhouse. It was about the little things in life, you know, the little things that could give you a little joy at that stage with all that suffering. So I'd give him his French fries, and he took me aside. He said, Matt, now is the time. Do what, whatever you, you know, need to do, but don't waste time, right? I worked all my life. And now look at me now. I worked all my life to save up money so I could retire and play golf with you, and now I can't. So, you know, there's so many little things along that journey of the four years where I started to go into health more than ever because it's all about not waiting until the symptoms come, right? The symptoms come and it's too late. You can't reverse all that stuff, right? So I started learning about fermentation. That's why we have this fermented beverage brand made from rainwater. We basically, basically capture rainwater and, and produce all these healthy beverages that we make. But that all started from gut health and trying to save my dad's life and improve my own health and my family. And that all started in our kitchen at home, just feeding our family different things. And my mother's a yoga teacher, so we, um, we were feeding the yoga community and they liked what we were making, so we ended up making a brand out of it. But really, that whole process of losing my father gave me so much. And to this day, I pray to him every day, and I thank him for everything that he gave me. Um, you know, from that whole tragedy, I was reborn in a different way. And now, um, stoicism, permaculture, epigenetics, <laughs> these are the things that drive me, okay? And creating symbiotic communities with people that I resonate with. And that, that goes to how, you know, I met Pablo, okay? I met Pablo mid-COVID at the, okay, the, the Rotary Club is a global club and they happen to, we have some friends in the book it that are, are very into permaculture and they said, Matt, we're starting a, ro uh, a Rotary Club chapter in Pachatu, Uluwatu, and it's gonna be all about sustainability. I said, I'm in, sign me up, okay? Cause I'm into permaculture. And then I go there for the first meeting and this guy's sitting there talking about plastic exchange and circular economies and how we're gonna save the world, right? And I go, okay, I like Pablo. So we had many meetings just as bros talking about all kinds of things that, you know, down the rabbit hole of sustainability and permaculture before I met you. And then, um, you know, he would come to our lab, the core culture lab, where we produce all of our, our fermented beverages and non-fermented beverages. Uh, and we'd have meetings about how we're gonna create this yaya-san and how uh, I'm very passionate about uh, sustainability, but in particular, you know, sometimes you need to focus on things. Uh, rainwater harvesting is a technique that I'm very adamant about um, using in Bali as a showcase through our business to help people understand about the groundwater situation in Bali and how they can make a difference uh, with the communities, the banjars, uh, businesses, individuals. But we do have a situation. The plastic has been very you know, talked about and a lot of people are doing great work. So now the next feed is the, is the water, the water table. And so we created a yayasan and um, and that's all, the, the, the Yaya song was aimed to, to, at, at rainwater harvesting and kind of helping uh, the driest communities of Bali uh, receive rainwater harvesting systems from us, okay? 
And so that morphed the day I met JP and Pablo, um, and we finally became a team uh, because there was so much more to do with this Yaya Sun, okay? Rainwater harvesting and the, the Make It Rain initiative that we're launching as we speak uh, is a component of that, but the impact fund is the, is the greater good where we can work with all the best NGOs and support them because people are not necessarily good at raising funds all the time. They're good at helping causes and doing things to, to support the people that need it the most. And so we're here to also provide new funding models for these NGOs. You know, that's brilliant. Like, I got goose pimples all the time with you guys here. It's crazy. <laughs> You know, <laughs> there's a lot to love about what you said. Mm. Uh, I don't want to unpack it all, mm. but it's such a beautiful, like, with each of the people here, you can see and feel what drives them, right? You can see and feel with JP, the heck, it's, he had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Ep DNA. Epigenetically, it was already done. It was like, hey, you're doing this sound. It's like, okay. <laughs> so he's just, he's just doing his thing. But the Pablo, like Mexico, there's a whole nother story there that we don't have time to go into today, but I'd love to go into because that's a huge part about what you do and, and the fact that, you know, you look for meaning, you know, like you look for meaning, you look for purpose. Where can I be useful? right? And you know exactly where that is, right? And as for you, you, you bridge both worlds, right, of this understanding that a personal loss. And there's a lady called Bronnie Ware. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Bronnie Ware before, but she's a terminal care nurse um, for many years. She's created a book called Regrets of the Dying. Mm. It's a book. It's been made into a film. Last time I spoke to her, it was supposed to be made into a film, but I think COVID put the brakes on it. And what it is is that uh, she... Um, was the vehicle for, for quite, for a lot of people over decades um, to pass away, right? Uh, palliative care, it's called. Mm. And so she asked a question to those that she could, you know, like, is there anything you regret, mm. right? And the top answer, right, there's a, there's a lot, but the top answer was, you know, I wish that I would have done the things that I wanted to do, not the things that other people wanted me to do. Repeat it once more. I wish that I would have done what I wanted to do, mm. not that the others wanted me to do. And it just stuck, right? And I hear that in your story, man. Mm. I hear that from, from, from your dad mm. who gave you that, right? Yeah. People work their whole lives for it and then realize when they get to that point, was that, was that, did, was that really worth it, right? Mm. Let's do this. Let's enjoy it along the way. Yeah. Right? Let's not just hold our breath and wait till we get to the end mm. and say, okay, I'm ready to breathe now and it's done. Mm. You know? But also, what I love about what you said is that it brings us into this other aspect of this, which is about where it's going, why are we doing it, what drives us, right? The Yaya Sons that you've all mentioned, they're all part of, who's doing good work? Mm right? Yeah. Who needs the support? Mm -hmm. Alternative funding models, mm -hmm. right? How can we be of value? How can we be of service to Bali, yeah. the people here in Bali? And those coming from overseas as well. So like on that, on that note, we're coming back to you, brother JP, you know, on this, um, you know, on this, like being of value, um, supporting the good works of other NGOs and so on. So how does that happen? through Mural Fest, let's start there, and Bali Collective. Uh, I'll, I'll let you freelance uh, in, in your answer. Draw from wherever you need to draw it from, baby. Over to you. Yeah, so Bali Collective is the, is the umbrella, the, the mama, the mothership. And Mural Fest is just one expression. So we'll have several expressions that f un you know, that come out throughout the years, you know? So a, whether it bring the top chefs in the world and do a culinary festival to feed people around the world and like to, to support these NGOs, whether it be a golf tournament, whether it be a, any kind of sports or, or entertainment like music festival or just using the arts as the catalyst, you know? Like the, uh, like I said in the last speech, you know, like I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the, the teachings of Mary Poppins. You know, you, it takes a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down, you know, and, and art is our 
is our sugar, you know, and, and the medicine are these healing methods that uh, we, we've been blessed to team up with several uh, organizations like Copernic and, and, and Good for Bali and, and others that have worked with dozens, if not hundreds, of high impact NGOs. So they feed us a, these beautiful lists of amazing people doing great things. A, and then we just create uh, the foundation. You know, like uh, our job is just to make fertile soil for everyone to come and plant their seeds. You know, so anyone that has a positive vision of the future, we will do everything in our power to facilitate their their vision of growth. You know, so uh, this festival is just one intonation of this, and you know the you know. Yeah. And so, uh, Brother Pablo, like, uh, what comes up for you, you know, in this? Uh, this particular aspect of the talk, which is about you know, the good work people are doing here in Bali and how we can support it, right, through Mural Fest uh, and initiatives like it, you know, like what comes up for you when I say, you know, people doing good work, how can it be supported? Where do you see the gap? Where do you see the need? So I, I always see that uh, there's people that want to make the difference. Uh, there's businesses that want to make the difference, that want to operate in a more sustainable way, and there's NGOs that definitely need the support. But then these people come and say, hey, how can I help you? And apart from donate here, it's very, very hard to give a specific way of how people can help uh, without them having to go far out of their way. So what we're kind of design here, it's a very dynamic way that allows everyone to help with what they are good at or what they enjoy, uh, which is arts. So we're creating these NFTs. These NFTs, at the end of the day, remove the technology out of it uh, and all the hype that has been happening and all the speculation. Uh, it's just a secure digital asset that allows you to kind of program money in a way. So you're giving the artist a way to change the world <clears throat> by just using their creative expressions. And yeah, through this programmable money, they can get paid at the same time. And then you're giving the person who's buying this NFT uh, a very simple way to support an artist and an impact initiative at the same time. Another thing that we're building is we're focusing on building utility, real world utility, remove that speculation side of it. No, this digital asset has an actual use. So we are going around and trying to create a loyalty membership program where whoever buys this NFT is gonna have discounts and perks that they'll be able to claim in several different businesses. And that is where you're putting another layer of how businesses can help. It's like you don't have to donate out of pocket. Like what if you just give a discount, a small percentage of the future value of your future sales, uh, just for those who have this uh, membership. And if they don't show up, you don't have to do the discount. But if they do, just give them the discount. Um, so yeah, just finding ways on how to make doing good a lot more dynamic and accessible for nice. everyone. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a business at home and you would like to support your local NGOs and yayasans and artist communities, please go to muralfest.com and sign up to give your discount to people who care. <laughs> you know, you, you almost are like, and a word from our sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so coming to Matt, so we've got Ludi from Harmony and, and our brother Emilia here from ICP. So some incredible technology companies, right, doing some incredible things with this new technology to empower mm. via impact NFTs and projects like Bali Collective, Mural Fest, to do some really good work, right? 
So in this whole technology sphere um, that we're in, because I know that you're, and obviously everybody here, but we're talking to Matt right now, you're very good at like bringing this to the real world, right? And that's what, you know, JP talk, talks about, what Pablo talks about, and obviously yourself about how do we bridge that gap mm -hmm. between this new technology and, and the real world. So keeping that in mind, you know, what comes up for you as one of the things that people might struggle with and how can they overcome that? Well, I think that one of the most difficult things is the getting past the, the crypto kind of hype or FUD, right? People don't know really what crypto is and they think it's just this speculative kind of gambling uh, world where it's not real and you know there's a lot of people losing money and you know uh, a lot of people really getting hurt from this uh, but there's a lot of people benefiting uh, significantly and, and it's kind of just really confusing to people I think so what's happened in, in, in many different industries you know you have something that catalyzes you know the technology and the use of it but then the underlying technology is really what matters and that's what endures and kind of evolves right and so the blockchain is that right and the ability to use the nft the nft is so much more than a jpeg that you see people collecting and and values being crazy that you know you don't understand why right so i think the nft is it's important to understand that the nft is a tool that is on the blockchain, that is, it can't be changed, it's authentic and it's immutable and it can be programmed so that as soon as somebody buys it, it money just naturally automatically goes to different counterparties. But I think that bridging the real world to the blockchain is, is, is very interesting, right? And that's what we're trying to do because we're working with you know, people that have never had exposure to this and we're trying to, during this time of when everything is just upside down, right? You know, Luna's gone down and the market is, is lower than it's ever been uh, in, in, in years, right? So it's the perfect time, really, to, to speak to the, the regular, the normal, the masses, okay, about this technology. Because through the art, through the impact, through understanding that if you buy this, this happens, and it doesn't have to be about you gambling. It's about this is something where you get uh, an, a digital asset. You get to actually download an app that we're going to be uh, providing to everybody. And this app is going to be able to you know, uh, allow you to purchase a digital asset using a credit card or crypto. If you have crypto, great. But if you don't have crypto, we're going to be able to make that available for people that don't have crypto. Okay? And that's, I think, one of the most important things because because that's the bridge right there. You know, if you don't have a, a MetaMask wallet and you don't have a bunch of crypto and you've been playing the game for a while, how do you get into the NFT world and get a, be a part of this, this new kind of utility and experiment? Well, we're going to make that more accessible through an app called Nest, and we're releasing that to the world with Nest. Um, so that's one way. Um, but I really like, you know, what, what ECTA is doing. ECTA is, is kind of using real world assets and, and tokenizing that and, and kind of allowing people to get, a, get a associated with a new realm of, of, uh, of um, cryptography and the blockchain through real estate and, and other uh, aspects of that. And just like, um, you know, Harmony and um, ICP, they're all doing different things that are very powerful, right? And, and people need to know more about these because there's, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty out there and I think that was created through the, through the kind of the recent, um, you know, market conditions, but now there's huge opportunity. There's huge opportunity to, to, to help have people understand it in a different way, yeah. All right, let's do, let's do, thank you, brother, man. Uh, let's do a real world poll, right? So people here uh, in the audience, by the way, you can join a studio audience, it's free. Uh, there's food and drink that you can buy. <laughs> you can't catch on, is a food and drink free? No, but you can come here. No membership required, right? No RSVP, just show up every Monday, six o'clock, pre-networking, 6.30, go live. So the people here, show of hands, just everyone's kind of moving and grooving over here. Who knows what an NFT is? Raise your hand. All right, cool, all right, cool. Um, who has bought an NFT? Raise your hand. Okay, so just to make sure I'm correct, who hasn't bought an NFT? Raise your hand, who hasn't? Okay, so for those of you watching on TV here, so we've got um, how many? Maybe we've got 80, 90% of the room knows what an NFT is, but then around about 
15 to 20 percent maybe have actually bought one right so while we're here um this one just shouted out so and i'm going to point you out this time so matt why haven't you bought an nft if there's two words why what what that what would that be i'd like my assets more tangible so you'd like have assets more tangible Gas fees, woohoo! Gas fees, Carol. Why, why haven't you bought an NFT yet? Because I don't really understand how it works. Got it. So don't understand. I, I, I don't trust you. So don't understand how it works. Don't trust. Okay, um, Sister Natalie, future co-host, speak up Monday. Basically, same as Carol, like lack of skills. Lack of skills, lack of knowledge. Okay, Brother Wolf. Understand it, but don't trust it. Great. A anybody else? Um, why they haven't bought an NFT? Anyone else? Okay. So those who have bought an NFT, um, just raise your hand and tell me why did you buy an NFT? So we'll start with, oh, mine's going to Ludi. Come on, man. Great. So, you, so you believe in the technology that underpins everything. Great. Emilio. Yeah. Profile picture, sending to a friend. There is a, there is somehow an uh, amusement in having an NFT or being gifted an NFT that people tend to forget. Yeah. It's not only speculation, right? For okay. beginners and early stages. And in our blockchain, there is basically no gas fee, so. No gas fees. I see. I see. Free blockchain. You heard it here first. So, Maybe not first. Uh, All right. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big NFT holder, anyway, okay. but I'm minting some pretty big uh, operations. All right, we're, so we're, we're going to get into after. So partly fun, um, new new technology. Why not? You strike me as a guy who's willing to step step on the step on the other side, right? Yeah, you're you're willing to take a, take a chance, take a risk. All right. Um, yes, my darling. Why why did you buy an NFT? Three three words that come into your mind, Denise. Great. Experiment, and as an artist, how does art cross over into the digital world? Beautiful. Thank you very much. Any of the two guys over here? Um, why did you buy NFT? Good. Yeah, but why, why, didn't you, why didn't you buy one? I haven't found one that I want to buy yet. Great. So you haven't found one you wanted to buy yet. Awesome. Have you bought an NFT? Great. So feel that you're not ready to understand. Got it, man. Well, I'm not going to put money when I don't understand it. Got it. Brother and sister over here. So you bought, I'm guessing. Yeah, we bought an um, NFT, but we, like, when I was young, I liked to collect like, a lot of Star Wars stuff, a lot mm. of skateboarding. Yeah. I love collecting things. So you're a collector of Star Wars skateboards. Okay. okay. But I noticed when I don't like having that much stuff now that I'm getting older, and we spend most of our time, everybody has a smartphone here, so yeah. I really believe in digital assets and that's Great. the future because Love it. And so he has no problem buying games. Yeah. He has no problem buying digital All right. So then what, what we're hearing, for those who can't hear that, and next time we'll give you a microphone. Um, so basically what, what you're saying is you're a collector from the get-go, right? As I think pretty much a lot of us here were, whether we, whether we believe it or admit it or not, it's the truth, mm -hmm. right? Collector. And then also, you know, you realize that technology is there to, it, it's, it's usable technology. It's on your phone. Our phones go everywhere with us. Your 19-year-old son is like, man, he's a generation that's like, hey, yeah, of course I'll buy it. Why wouldn't I? So this is a generational thing, right? And quite a few of us here, I know, uh, uh, let, let's just say there's a vintage to us. <laughs> A vintage to us, right? Which I can see as well is a possibly a block. So to, it feels like a panel discussion now. Uh, Bali Collective, Mural Fest. So when you hear these sorts of things, right, from people who are general public, right, nothing general about you, by the way, you're a beautiful public, uh, like what goes to your mind? Right? This is to any of you, right? What goes to your mind? Let me just say one thing for the people that don't understand NFTs or blockchain. Imagine, for example, even a, a non, like a transferable NFT is what we're talking about, where you can resell it. Imagine a technology also, like for a, a diploma from university, 
or an event ticket where you don't want to have, you only want to have one that goes to one person and it can't go to anybody else. And that needs to be authentic and verifiable. So NFTs serve that purpose too, right? So say you uh, get an award or a diploma or something like that where a diploma goes to the graduate and they should always have that. What if they lose their diploma or their certificate? An NFT provides that digital asset that is never, uh, you know, it's, it, it's indestructible and, and nobody can ever take that away from you or, or counterfeit it. So that's one thing. Um, but then imagine um, a piece of art that also is a membership card. You usually get a membership card, you lose your membership cards, but this one you don't lose, and it's always yours, and you can protect it, and, uh, and then also it's a digital asset, and, and you own that art for people that like and appreciate digital art, that's one thing. And then also it has smart contracts that program how the money is sent, and maybe to maybe it goes to one person because they, they're selling an NFT, but maybe it goes to 100 different people, and maybe it goes to every time it's resold, the artist gets a royalty because artists now are the most underappreciated uh, you know, group of, 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 of creators, right? Uh, and and they, they should reap the benefits of the long-term potential of those sales. So this is something that can also affect the art world in a very positive way because it's programmable in that sense. Um, and just one more thing is, is on the app, okay? So the Nest app is a layer zero, okay? You, you have layer ones, you have layer twos. This is a layer zero. Zero gas fees, okay? And in the app, you can mint your own NFTs. You can take a photo, you can mint an NFT right there. You can create smart contracts right there with a click of a button and not having to know code or anything about blockchain. And then you can also uh, you know, purchase NFTs, you can sell them, you can send them to different marketplaces like OpenSea or you know, different blockchains like Solana or any other blockchain, it's fully interoperable. So ICP could be on the, on the Nest app and Ecta is gonna be on the Nest app. So it's this- Harmony. Harmony as well. And, uh, but the, but the, the main thing is that you can, you can basically have this, this app be a layer zero where you have zero gas fees and you can host all of your NFTs and then when you want to use a different blockchain, you pay those gas fees. I know, but just before J JP chimes in, yeah. Mint, there might be some people here who don't know what the word Mint is, and we said minting, Mint. So yeah. brother, yeah, you, you, you describe. All right, so let me uh, take you on a journey. Uh, when you walk into the festival at Tomorrow Gallery on the 9th of July, you're gonna, it's a walking mall in Brawa, and you'll walk through, and there'll be artists lined in different spots and they're gonna be painting live in front of you. Each of these artists are paired with an NGO that you'll be able to see their story beside them. A, and a QR code will be there, like maybe right at the front, you'll be greeted by a lovely person that will explain a little bit about what's going on. You'll be able to download the app for free. A, and then you can either buy that NFT right then and support that great cause and that artist, or you could also, you know like when it's your birthday on Facebook, they'll be like, support a cause. You can take a photo or a video yourself through the app and then be like, send it out to all of your friends on social media and be like, hey, I wanna support this school being built. I wanna support this orphanage. I wanna support thousands of plastic being taken out of the ocean. A, and then they can send it out to all their friends and then they can buy that NFT. In the smart contract that's in there, a, it's already like instantly, a, when you buy that, the money will go directly to that NGO. It doesn't come to us and sit in our bank account and then wait for our administrator to send it out. It goes directly into that bank account, uh, that wallet of that NGO. So when we talk about minting, minting is basically you take the photo in this app and be like, I want to send this to be in a digital asset. Boop. Like, uh, think of it like a crowdfunding. You know, like, it, it, people are very, like, even myself, like, it, I've been around a bunch of crypto people for many, many years. Like, w one of my last, uh, the last festival, uh, Jerry Tarabell, he was one of the founders of Etsy. He, he bought a ton of, of, uh, Let me help you with minting. So minting would be, the, 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 yeah. the answer for minting would be, bringing the actual digital asset onto the blockchain. So you can lazy mint, right? So that would be where you actually don't have the, the NFT on the actual blockchain yet, but you put it on OpenSea or a marketplace. And then when the, the buyer purchases it, 
then the, the fees or the gas fees are incurred and it actually then goes live onto the blockchain. So that would be a, a minting example. Yeah. Back to you, JP, or publish. Think. There you go. <laughs> hey, yeah, hey, thank you. Uh, so we are also in our partnership with ECTA. They have a partnership with tourism. So when, you, when people land at the airport, there'll be a booth there where you can download the app. And all of our spaces where we create these public arts, you'll, you'll have this QR code that you can hit with your phone, and then it will take you on a scavenger hunt. And it's gamification. So like the more that you're in this app, if you watch a video about the NGO, if you read about an artist, if you share it on social media, you're going to gain points. You're going to win some of their coins. You're going to get free white lists and different NFTs dropped into your wallet. And the more and more you explore the island, so like we're going to take you beyond the, the Chenggu and, and Ubud and Sonor and Uluwatu. We'll take you to beautiful volcanoes and like play little villages you've never heard of before. And then you're going to see like a beautiful little piece of art with a QR code you're going to hit it, and then it's going to activate AR, augmented reality. And things are going to dance around you and tell a story, and it's like going to tell the story of the, the history of that land and the people that live there, of the NGOs and the Yaya-sans that we're supporting in that community, the artists that are supporting this community, and how you can get involved. And then it will take you to another place. And then all of a sudden, you have free T-shirts and free coffees and free nights to stay in resorts and all this amazing, cool benefits that all of our partners come in. And everyone is accepted. Like, come. Like, we, we live by four pillars. A sustainability, a accessibility, innovation, and social impact. A so this accessibility is very important. You know, like a lot of people have felt left out of the crypto world just because it's a whole nother language. And the people that get into the crypto world, they're really hardcore in it, that that's the only language they want to speak. It's, so we're, we're trying to demystify this whole crypto thing, you know, because a long time I was very skeptical of it. You know, like I saw this bear market that happened because like, everyone was saying, the, the regular stock market will crash, but this will never happen. And we're seeing it happen. So I was like, ah, but NFTs are completely separate from this. You know, like, the, the, you, you can't just sell an NFT when you want to. Someone has to buy it, uh, and it, it retains its value or it grows in value. And the more and more people uh, that have businesses that want to help us with discounts and be a part of our reward system, that gives more strength to this NFT. It, it cr increases in value. So you don't have to bring money out of your pocket, but we will drive traffic to you if you become part of this membership program and we have a whole interactive map. So you're like, I bought this NFT, where can I get my value out of it? And like, I'm in Ubud for the day and you'll see like 60 to 100 places pop up. Okay, I'm gonna go to that spa, I'm gonna get that massage, I'm gonna have that sound healing, I'm gonna go to that restaurant, I'm gonna stay in this resort, and then I'm gonna get on that yacht, and then I'm gonna go to Speak Up Monday. <laughs> you know, like, it's, we, we had a meeting the, the other day and uh, one of the guys in there was so it was like, when JP speaks, like you're transported to a different world. <laughs> and it's so true. But look, what we're going to do, uh, can we try and keep this to an hour? I'm pretty sure we're at the hour, but that's okay. So Matt, your microphone, Brother Guzman, if we can grab Matt's microphone, take it to the audience. So what we'll do, we'll have time for a couple of questions on camera, and then, and then we'll, 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 we'll close it off, and then we can have um, some like private questions afterwards uh, that will be off camera. So if you you have a question, uh, and we're working out to get the cable to you, put your hand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. That's it. And before we get to the question, so JP or any of the guys here, so how does someone join Mural Fest as an artist? Um, how does someone join Mural Fest um, just as a public person uh, looking to come and be educated? Because a, a big part of this is about education, as we can hear. So that's also part of it. Because again, we have to find a way to bring people from the real world to this and vice versa. Otherwise, it's never going to gain adoption, right? It would always be that thing that like, I wish I knew it, understood it, but I don't, I don't trust it, as we can hear. And we, we, we want the collector mindset, we want your mindset, right? Which is like, hey, this thing is awesome. My 19 year old is buying them left, right and center. We need to get with this because it's a great way to distribute wealth across borders to the projects which are uplifting humanity. 
for example. So questions, put your hand up. Do not be shy. Um, so I'm going to go to the guys. Um, why we why the guys think about a question? Um, is there anything else um, that comes up at the moment that you think is important or valuable for people watching this? And also tell them about where to go to register um, that you think would be important right now. With regard to Mural Fest. With regard to Mural Fest, yeah. You all right? And Matthew's got a question anyway. I can see he's queuing up for. Go ahead. The eyebrows are going. I can see he's got the question. What one of those curvy questions? Carol's got one too. All right. So, so real quick, if you, you would like to join Mural Fest in Bali Collective, all you have to do is go to muralfest.com. There is a link that's sign up, and then you can. It's a Google form. You'll fill it out, we'll get back to you, and we build. You know, we start a conversation. We're real people, and we just want to link up with as many beautiful people in the world as we can, you know? And then help us create larger bandwidth, you know? Like, we're three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, like a million. And, you know, we work together. So uh, it, everyone has a skill to share as well. You know, so don't think that you don't have anything to offer, because everyone does. So, uh, Telegram and WhatsApp groups. Oh yeah, and there's Telegram, WhatsApp. You know, like just search for Mural Fest and you'll find us. Yeah. Beautiful. So, brother Matthew, and then we have got our sister Carol. Yep. So, Matthew. Uh, JP. So you were saying um, we go to Tomorrow Gallery and there's somebody there making a painting. Is this a analog painting? And if so, what happens to that analog painting after? And what other sorts of non-digital artwork will be created? Um, sculpture, photography, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, the physical paintings uh, will be for sale. It will probably have a high value NFT that you get the physical pieces with it. it uh, but then we're also going to have uh, all the bands that play, right? So uh, we're going to mint an NFT all their sets uh, from the filmmakers. So we're recruiting filmmakers. If you're a filmmaker or photographer, please reach out to us because we want to film everything, right? So we'll be creating short films where the filmmaker will uh, tell the story of the NGO, Yaya San, the story of the artist, the story of the festival, the story of the community that we're in. Uh, and it will be like a two to five minute piece. And then we'll mint that and create collections off of those. You know, and then we can create several collections to where, like, uh, when we talk about accessibility, we'll make 2,000 in a collection and we'll sell them for a 200K to 300K. You know, uh, and then we're also doing fashion. So uh, the shirt that I'm wearing from Rabindra and Myra, uh, the, the link in uh, this post, I'll have a link to them, and they're also on our website. Amazing, sustainable fashion, right? So we'll, we'll create. Uh, NFTs out of fashion, and then we'll embed them with AR as well. Uh, and then so like you can walk around and people can like just pick up their phone and like push it at you and you, you have like a, a dragon swirling around you or like, you know, like a, a beautiful wave you're riding or like whatever we uh, program in there, you know? Uh, uh, what else? Uh, we have all types of fine art, sculpture, painting, even writing, performance art, you're a dancer, you're a fire dancer. It, all the creative arts are, are mintable, you know? So the, the real important thing is that we're helping impact on this island and then beyond, you know? Like, think of your favorite Yaya San or NGO, your favorite cause. Uh, nine times out of 10, we're gonna have it, and if we don't, please suggest it to us, and we would love the support. You just made me think of one thing when you said think of your favorite cause. I think one of the most important things that, that we're, you know, obviously wanting to make clear that when we're working with Yayasans or NGOs, it's that the, each NGO we're, we're working with, they need to have specific projects that have funding requirements and it has to be super clear on what they're trying to achieve and a budget that needs to be met so that we can kind of validate and verify that that actually is being done. So that's very important. Yeah. So what we go to uh, Sister Carol, you have a question? Yes, to every single one of you, um, because we're talking about art. So what I would love to know is, how does it make you feel to see art being created in front of you? Question is, how does it feel to have art created in front of you? Yeah. For me, it, it, it's an inspiring feeling. Um, I. I become, uh, I admire artists um, because I, it's a, a skill that I wish I had. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's um, 
Yeah, it's almost like magic to me, you know? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so special, and to be able to help artists um, access more, um, you know, followers and, and um, buyers and, and appreciators, that's, a, that's something that I can help with, but uh, I'm, I'm not that type of artist, and, I, and I, wish I, I wish I could, ever since I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, it, it also depends a lot on which type of art. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch Bob Ross. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know him. Uh, it was super good. He just made it look so easy. Um, then when you were trying to do the same, it was not easy at all. So you can, you can appreciate the skill of a person that makes it look so easy. Uh, it makes it look so good. And then you have, for example, music. Um, music, you can always hear a recording, but it's never the same as looking at your favorite artist or looking at live music. Um, yeah, so the, the experience of contemplating it and seeing it on the process of being making, um, it's definitely very different. But they're good. What a JP. Yeah, so my mother's a prolific painter, and she gave birth to five little babies. And in our garage, there's hundreds of paintings of mom and JP, mom and Nola, mom and Maya, mom and Benjamin, mom and Justine. And we'd be in her arms, like holding her hand while she paints, you know? So, uh, and I've been blessed to, to make art and, and creativity a part of my entire life to where I've been producing and curating and developing public art festivals and concerts and culinary festivals and circuses my entire adult life. So uh, one thing that I've, I, I love about our festivals is that like, and my attempt in this process is to suspend reality. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so so uh, for me, Carol, I'll ask that question as well, right? I, I, Pablo mentioned music. Two days ago, I did a post that was taken down, so no one really got to see it. And it was because I copied uh, one of my favorite pieces of music by John Coltrane, My Favorite Things, right? Beautiful track. The thing about watching this thing live is that even not live, you get to experience and to feel every nuance of what was happening for him at that time from the racism, everything. You feel it all in every note that's played on his clarinet. Like, you feel everything. So, what I love, and just connecting these things together, you know, like, uh, I was doing, um, uh, I was having a talk the other day uh, at, at a pitching event that we were all, all at. And what I asked was that the people who live here in Bali, which was about 80% of the audience, had they heard of Tri Hita Kadana, right? And, and out of the 80% that, that live here in Bali, maybe 20% put their hands up. So this is really important, right? Because this, to me, is the reason why I love this project, right? So Tri Hita Kadana, and I'll do the best I can to describe it, <laughs> is, you know, for, for Bali tradition, uh, it's a way of life, right? A way to happiness, a way to well-being. And imagine it as a triangle. So at the top of the triangle, and the way that I look at this and use it in every project that I work on is I say, what is the impact of what I am doing on X, right? So what is the impact of what I am doing on X? So top of the triangle is, you know, is um, man to God, human to God, which is, uh, you know, what I see as being culture, custom, tradition. So what I'm doing now, what is the impact on that? Next one is environment. So, you know, so what is my impact of doing this on the environment, sustainability, regenerative, and all the rest of that? And the last one is, you know, is... Um, <laughs> Ah, breathe. Okay, prosperity, human to human. So, so 
these things, this triangle is a perfect template for creating income in a way that's sustainable, regenerative, and is creating a quadruple win outcome. So what does that mean? old paradigm that some people are still shut in, but they're going to be out in a very short period of time, is I win, you lose. That's done, right? Or we get together, we win, you lose. Not so good either. So a quadruple win outcome is if we look at these three elements, right? So how is what I'm doing impact tradition, culture, well-being there? What is that? How does it impact the environment? What's that story? And then how does it impact prosperity? Right? Then what we're able to do is to create a quadruple win outcome, which means that this is good for everyone. So what Mural Fest does, what Bali Collective is all about, in my, in my humble opinion, is it's, uh, it's a vehicle to create quadruple win outcomes for Bali and the people in Bali, and, and the, the, the master plan, which I, I've spoken for too long again, but I don't care, I love this stuff. <laughs> what it's about as well is, you know, is creating opportunities for Balinese to be stakeholders in their own future. Mm -hmm. And that's at the ground of what this is. So answered your question first, but then went off on a tangent, but hey, this is how we roll. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you want to and, and the vast uh, majority of the artists are Balinese. Yeah. Uh, this is all about uh, really supporting this culture uh, and teaching the history and and truly learning how to be visitors here and be a part of it. You know, uh, so we we hope to create a journey from the moment someone gets off the plane to be able to expose and learn and share and, and really be one with the culture that's here, you know? Yeah. Mm. And the king, maybe talk about the king. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you can talk about the king. I was just gonna say that the, the three hit the karana, yeah, made me think about um, Core Culture Lab. When we started our business, we, we have a logo that has three pillars in it. And one of them was permaculture, right? And permaculture has a similar um, three pillars, right? Um, it has take care of people, take care of earth, and fair share, right? And it's, it's everybody wins, right? Mm -hmm. And then the stoicism, you know, you, you choose, your choices are everything, right? So choose, you know, choose wisely. And then also uh, epigenetics, right? Yeah. And so with, with Core Culture Lab, that was the main focus is to really use health and sustainability to, to be a showcase for, you know, how you can take a business and incorporate all this and make it fun, right? And so I think that's what led us to kind of meeting, which is, you know, the tree hit the karana and, uh, and, and, and permaculture, right? Yeah. You can talk about the king if you like. Uh, the the yep. king, yeah. So on um, the second of July, we will be um, commencing opening ceremonies uh, in Tabanan, uh, in Kerambitan, with uh, King Irwan, uh, and it's going to be a, a special day where we invite all of our partners, NGOs, artists, uh, collaborators, to come and enjoy the the culture. Um, this is through uh, live dance ceremonies that are uh, generational, uh, you know, performances that we, we, we intend on helping preserve through NFTs. And uh, this will be a, a time to help restore the palace that has been degraded over time. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful opportunity to bring the NFT technology uh, to an actual tangible cultural project. And so uh, we hope that people can join us to, to come and and experience this firsthand. Um, and it will be a beautiful example of how you can use live art, um, music, and, um, and performances as, as NFTs as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, JP? Yeah. So yes, uh, some of the first NFT collections that we'll be creating will be for the Royal Palace of Karambatan uh, with King Erwan. Uh, so there's five kingdoms within Bali and this is the only kingdom that has not brought uh, updated renovations of like architecture to their kingdom. So it still has the original 350 year old architecture. This is also the kingdom where his father was the first to bring Westerners into Bali and share culture. Uh, like we know about Bali like because Mick Jagger came and David Bowie and Amon and, and Reagan and Whitney Houston and all these people. They were hosted by King Erwan's father. You know, so they have a generational uh, historical legacy that we hope to continue 
through these NFTs. And then at this uh, opening ceremonies, it's really uh, also an educational point of, of teaching the kingdom and all the other Yaya sons and all of our creative brothers and sisters what this new rev revenue stream is. Because like we'll onboard all of these artists first to create these impact NFTs, but then we also really want to support our creative communities to where they'll be getting the majority of the sales before, but now they're part of this large larger global collective that uh, gets more noise, you know, because anyone can mint an NFT. Doesn't mean it's going to sell. But like when you have a, a strong collective and, and uh, a global force that's behind it, it, that's when you can get traction and movement. So maybe their first impact NFT sell, but then someone really likes that artist and it's like, yo, I really, I want to support this artist to where like they'll just be minting and, and minting and minting and like, all of a sudden they don't have to go to a, a typical gallery anymore where they'll take 50% of their earnings. You know, they could be making 80, 90, 95%, 100% of their earnings, you know? Eh, because like they don't necessarily need us as well. As if they start to really blow up, it's like, yo, I'm flying solo, but I'll be back for the next NFT festival, you know? <laughs> you got me for life, you know? Because like we create lifelong partnerships, you know? Like we don't, we're not thinking short term. Eh, and then we don't waste breaths. Like every step is calculated in a way of how can we create more impact, you know? So we're bringing all of these aspects in the world. Like we consider ourselves like an, an octopus, you know? So we have the NGO world, we have the crypto world, we have the, the influencer world, we have the, the creative world. We have all of these different aspects in our community and we sh all share a common bond of wanting to grow and wanting to move forward in a sustainable fashion. You know, so, so don't get like bogged down by the tech and like the crypto and stuff. If you want to make this world a better place, here is one way you can do it. We're not saying that we're solving all the problems, but if you come and join us, maybe we can. You know, because uh, these problems are big and, you know, they might be bigger than me, they might be bigger than you, but they ain't bigger than you and me. <laughs> can you dig it? <laughs> So look, what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, begin to wrap up and then we have some private questions uh, when the cameras are off. So just um, I'll do something closing, but would love uh, to hear from each, each of you like a closing uh, comment. And I'll give you a minute or so to think about what that is. So I'm not going to put you on the line right now. And then have a think about what that is. And then, uh, th then we'll, we'll close out, probably go in reverse order. So Brother Matt, Brother Pablo, Brother JP. Uh, to, to, to finish it off. So just, and then, then we'll close this part and we'll have some private questions for the guys who are here. So um, I'll do the little closing now. Have a think of anything that, it might be reiterating something that you've said already or it might be something new that comes in. All right, either way, um, feel free to go. So I'll do this close first. So just want to thank everybody here. Studio audience, thank you so much for being here. And remember, it's free, complimentary, no membership, nothing needed, no RSVP even every month. Monday, come at 6, pre-networking, 6.30, go live here at Tropical Nomad in Changu. And look, next week is Fei Wong. So Fei uh, has a company, Kumpul, which is the largest collection of um, co-working spaces in Indonesia. She's also, uh, you know, when it comes to this ecosystem of startups, is probably one of the largest in Indonesia as well. So she'll be here next week. A phenomenal, she has a phenomenal backstory, which you will love. And she's, uh, yeah, she's a powerful woman, right? So that's next week. Don't miss that one. And things which I like to just... Um, to, to fill in a few gaps, right? So, you know, what this is called Destination Indonesia. That's what the show is called. We're up to almost 300 episodes pretty soon. So it's about Indonesia. We focus on Bali because we're in Bali, but it is actually about Indonesia. And you will know from just the things which I've said in the past of, of why I'm passionate about Indonesia, why I think Indonesia is the best place to be in the next 10, 15 years plus, right? Um, part of what you're going to see in the next coming weeks is kind of why that is. Right, if you haven't seen it already. So make sure you do tune, tune in. A shout out to our brother uh, Wayne, who's created the largest, um, the largest ooh, Alibaba type marketplace for Indonesians, which is now live. It's called Bayamia. 
buyamia.com. So buyamia. So buy a m i a buyamia. He also started the funding, which is like a Shark Tank for Indonesian businesses. Phenomenal project. So check it out. First largest marketplace. So what it, what what that basically means is that Indonesia has the largest concentration of artisans in the world. But one of the biggest challenges was how do those artisans get to their market overseas without a middleman that sometimes doesn't really do the right thing. This marketplace allows that to happen for probably the first time. So it is huge. So buyamia.com, go check it out. And we're going to have him on the show pretty soon as well. So look out for him there. And who else? Tropical Nomad. We have Brother Ichi, we have Brother Guzman and Sister Ayu, who are here every week supporting us to support you to create this incredible experience, which is, you know, audio visual. Uh, if it wasn't for them, I'd still be on my phone trying to do Facebook Live and keeps dropping out all the time. Oh, I remember those times. Oh, that was heavy. That was harsh. It was tough. Oh, it was tough. But now, now we're in a much better place where it looks good, smells good, and we actually get shareable content that we can share, that people can actually hear what you're saying and see you. These things are not to be taken for granted. Let, trust me. I've been there. Oh, take a breath. Woo. So thank you to those guys. Thank you to you. Um, thank you to my brother's um, Bali Collective, uh, Brother Matt, Brother Pablo, Brother JP. Really uh, appreciate all of you for coming and appreciate you for being there and accepting me in the team. Uh, it, again, I see phenomenal things. I love the fact that, that I can do the things that, lo that I love and that inspire the, the shit out of me, right? Um, that can help to really uh, mm -hmm. co-create, mm -hmm. co-elevate and bring you know, the just incredible projects to humanity. That's what turns me on. That's what I love doing and it's, and it's what this is about. So without further ado, in reverse order, just uh, some words from each of you, and then we'll close this part here, and, and we'll, we'll go to the, the private session afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is not about Mural Fest. This is more about just my personal kind of outlook and experience on, on life. And you know, the, this theory of epigenetics that I keep coming back to, it's, uh, it's so important to me because, you know, my, just, just to kind of give some power to the people out there, um, my grandfather died of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> my, um, my, my grandfather died of ALS. Two grandfathers died of ALS, Alzheimer's, and another grandmother of ALS. Another one had diabetes, but uh, she didn't die from diabetes. So I should be doomed, right? Um, but if you believe and you use the theory of epigenetics to transform your DNA so that you have a full potential, right? This is the most empowering thing that you can ever do because we are not predetermined, right? It's all about our environment. Our environment is the most important thing. And, and that is just on a, on a scientific level when it comes to biology. But if you think about behavioral epigenetics, we're all living proof of this right now. We're all here in Bali. We're surrounding ourselves with each other, community that is supportive. We're surrounding our minds with positive uh, thoughts. We're putting the right food into our bodies. We're, we're meditating. We're, we're, we're part of something that is promoting our DNA to express itself in the right way, in the, it has the full potential. There's people out there that have, uh, you know, that don't have any history of, of, of medical ailments in their genealogy or their, in their genetics, excuse me, and they die of a disease, right? So it's all about, just like you said, about the fertile soil, right? It's all about us as the seed putting it into the fertile soil. You could take the same seed with the same DNA and put it in sh shit, and you can put it in fertile soil and one will grow beautifully and the other will die, right? And so it's all about epigenetics. And I just say that, hey, listen, you, we have so much more control than we think. And so harness that, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Brother Yeah. Brother P? Yeah. So last message. Um, related to what Matt was saying and everything that's been said through the entire conversation, uh, I think the real message that I'd like to give here, it's um, there's a lot of big, big problems out there and 
making a difference shouldn't be about sacrificing everything that we do. It's just all about how can we use our creativity and our passions and leverage that to make a change. And you, you, ne you never know. You can just be talking and you might be thinking that no one is even listening. But you might be surprised of what the outcome might be. So, yeah, short. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, brother. Boom. Yes, I uh, first thank you all for uh, coming and watching at home. Uh, I'd say all of this is really about family for me. You know, I've been blessed to be born in a, a huge family that I wouldn't know who I am without them. And as I've traveled the world, I always look to find those same type of relationships of trust and love and, and supporting. And it's you all, like the, these brothers up here and the sisters at home, and, and, and they're the ones that inspire me to dream big. You know, like, because alone I would never be able to do any of the things that I've ever been able to accomplish in my life. And, and I look forward to meeting all of you in the future and becoming family with you and building and dreaming even bigger. Uh, uh, my heart is constantly being filled with inspiration, with every new conversation of, of positivity and love. And like, you, I found a long time ago that the human beings are, have two impulses that we live by. We're either making our decisions from love or from fear. And when I have my family around me, every single decision is based off of love. Uh, like from, to take that job, am I afraid to be poor? You know, to, to marry that woman, am I afraid to be alone? Or to dream that big, because I love all the people around me and they inspire me to, and give me the courage to believe that I can. Uh, because there are moments when it gets so big and like there's like a lot and like now we're on TV telling everybody like if this doesn't work it's like oh damn I might have to leave Bali y'all like hey, you said you're gonna do this and you said you're gonna save everybody I'm like whoo it's pressure y'all I need you everybody at home show up if nobody shows up to tomorrow I'm on the first boat out of this piece <laughs> But really, on, on the real tip, no, that actually is real. Like, y'all better show up. Like, yeah. But uh, yeah, like, it, it all comes from love. And like, uh, I, I thank my mother. I thank my father on this Father's Day. I just got to speak with all my family. It was beautiful. Like, they're, they're all back in the States. And they just constantly remind me how blessed I am and to, to have these other beautiful souls here. You know, because like, when I look at all of you, and I see your eyes, and like, there's just light shining, you know? So let, let's shine brighter. You know, yeah, yeah, so. You know, so guys, uh, thank you. Remember, muralfest.com, July 9th, starts at Tomorrow Gallery here in Brower. Show up and, uh, and support. Uh, it's an incredible project for all the reasons that we've gone into tonight. And I just want to thank you, audience, once more. Round of applause for Mural Fest Bali Collective in the house, baby. Let's do this. <laughs> the one and only Rob. Him. Bonin. Always bringing the flavor. Always bringing the love. Yes, I. Cut it.